it probably comes as no surprise to anyone in this room that the issue of religion, religious identity, faith, and belief have already emerged both explicitly and implicitly during the course of this year's campaign season. And I think it's safe to predict that we have only seen a glimpse of what is coming for us in the next few months as we make the final turn towards the November finish line. And that is why I'm truly excited about the topic of today's talk. I actually cannot think of a more timely subject to kick off as the first of our summer lecture series. And we are especially fortunate because our guest today, Dr. Marie Griffith, may be one of the most singularly qualified scholars to speak on the topic of how religion will shape and be shaped by the coming electoral contest. Dr. Griffith serves as the John C. Danforth Distinguished Professor in the Humanities at Washington University, where she is also the director of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics, as well as the editor of the journal Religion and Politics. She has previously held faculty positions at both Princeton and Harvard before coming to WashU in 2011. The litany of awards, citations, positions, and other CV material uh, that she has kind of been honored with is far too voluminous to recount here. But what I will say, just in passing, is that even a, a moderate familiarity with her work quickly reveals that Dr. Griffith's approach is one that is well attuned to the pedagogical vision here at COA. It is interdisciplinary, perhaps, perhaps maybe post-disciplinary. It's in some respects the topics, the questions, and the subjects that seem from the outside at least to most interest her and inform her work. And it is that interest which in turn drives the interdisciplinary methods that she then marshals to tackle any given issue, something we kind of are attuned to here at the college. Dr. Griffith is the author of a number of influential texts that lie at the intersection of politics, religion, sexuality, and gender. This includes a litany of books, journal articles, anthology chapters, and edited collections. Her most recent book project, which is set to be published next year, is titled, and wait for it, quote, Moral Combat, How Sex Divided American Christians and Fractured American Politics. I gotta tell you, without exactly knowing what's going to be covered, the title alone sold me on the pre-order. So just to let you all know, that's something you might wanna go out and get. So please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest to help kick off this year's lecture series, Dr. Marie Griffith. I just told Jamie that was just about the nicest uh, introduction I've ever had. Thank you so much. He did forget to tell you one little detail that um, I, I only just now mentioned to him right before this talk, which is that I'm a summer resident of Southwest Harbor. So uh, it's very fortunate uh, for me to have this opportunity uh, to speak to you all, because usually I'm doing what you're doing, hiking and, and uh, kayaking and all the rest of it during the summer. Um, so yes, it is an election year, and most of us have probably been, perhaps for months, torn between total addiction to our favorite news source covering the candidates and utter despair and disgust at the state of our public discourse and the media's relentless stoking of scandal and celebrity worship over substance. So the question for me is, where does religion fit into all of this? And as it turns out, it's all over the place. So I want to get to that, but first I'd like to give just a little bit of background context uh, for a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll uh, move into the present and what's going on now and what's likely to go on um, into the election. One of the great questions on people's minds after absorbing the vast reporting about the world today amid growing internationalism and enduring global conflict across continents is how religion in all of its diverse manifestations and local appropriations will ultimately shape the political future, both domestically and internationally. When I speak in public venues around the country, uh, this question gets a lot of traction and very passionate discussion from people across political party affiliations and religious identities. Orlando, Colorado Springs, Istanbul, Bangladesh, San Bernardino, 
Myanmar, Paris, Brussels, Lahore, Peshawar, London, New York, and on and on and on. The entire hour that I've been allotted here today could be filled 10 times over with the naming of places that have even just in recent years been attacked by killers invoking religious justification. I don't know then that there's a more important question for the current global moment than how religion works to mobilize people to such horrific acts of terroristic violence how religious leaders can aggravate uh, racism and ethnic hatred, for instance, uh, the, this loathing of religious and racial and ethnic others, and then somehow turn that hatred into brutal acts of savagery and bloodshed. So this question of religion's public, global, political role is a question so enormous and so daunting that, of course, it overwhelms reasoned deliberation. Otherwise, rational people can find themselves making blunt attacks on religion per se as a thoroughly universally evil force. Uh, so, you know, representatives of this view would be Sam Harris, uh, Richard Dawkins, the folks who really say there, no good ultimately comes out of religion. Some other people, of course, presume that their own religious worldview um, it w offers the only cure to all the suffering and malaise and violence and, and death that threaten to dispirit us. Many versions of the famous Clash of Civilizations thesis exemplify the urgent attempt to fathom just the complexity of religion and politics as they intersect and collide in different ways today. And, and not only to fathom this, th this complexity, but to achieve some sense of order and control over it. The determination to remake the United States of America into a Christian nation is another expression of this desire for order and clarity, as is the heated impulse to banish all traces of religion from the public sphere. So even before we get into the current uh, election cycle, I think there are two very important points to make about the interface of religion, politics, and public life in our broader national history. Uh, the first point is simply that religion, however we define it, and there are of course many different ways to define religion and describe just what it is, but religion has always been intricately entwined in American politics. It's visible especially at election times, uh, but it's always been intricately entwined, and yet there have also always been efforts and strong forces at work to separate them. As historians of American religion today repeatedly note, from the very beginning of European settlement, going back to the Spanish and French explorers and then the English Puritans and other Protestant dissenters who arrived here, uh, North America has shown itself to be among the most pervasively diverse religious and social experiments in history. And again and again, we see that these groups, our, our history is a history of struggle and of these various groups working to put their own theological and cultural stamp on American institutions and politics and all too often strive to prevent other groups from doing the same. Thomas Jefferson, for one, avidly sought to draw boundaries between religion and politics. And while he did so mostly to protect the state from church intrusion, he was also concerned about protecting religion from political corruption. Keeping religion from politics meant that both would retain a greater amount of purity in Jefferson's view. Truth would prevail if left to herself, he wrote, and while truth imposed on others, politically or religiously, would only engender corruption. And so we've been debating this issue really ever since. So that's the first point, that these conflicts between religion and politics have always been with us as a nation. But point two, changes have clearly occurred over the last half century to make religion an increasingly divisive issue in our public and political life today. 
and recent election cycles, and we need to understand those changes as well. Uh, three of the most important changes in recent decades are, are these, and these are not the only changes that we've seen in the past half century, of course, but ones particularly germane for us today are these. First, the new immigration patterns that occurred in the wake of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 that have led to the growth and flourishing of many religious groups besides Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, um, and an overall shift then in U.S. religious demographics. So that's been a huge and major shift over time, just since 1965. A second change uh, comes about as the new media landscape in recent years has grown and proliferated in ways we never could have imagined uh, just even a few decades ago, including the internet, the impact of technology on religious and political expression, public communication, and cultural consumption. So this is, we know, a major, major change, and has had a big impact on how religion is communicated, how it is commodified, and how it is practiced. So that's a, a huge change right there. And then thirdly, I would say, is um, the shift toward an increasing emphasis on globalization, transnationalism, global concerns, including attention to colonialism, imperialism, and the political power of religion in regions of the world such as the Global South. So as a result of these and, and of course other changes, we do now live in an era of irrefutable religious globalization, one in which traditions such as Mormonism, Pentecostalism, and Islam continue to grow rapidly throughout the world even as these and many other traditions continue to multiply and encounter one another within our own nation's borders. So in the wake of these tidal shifts that have taken place since the 1950s, 1960s, the United States truly stands today as something like a spiritual mirror of the world's religions. All of these changes pointing to the rapid intensification of our nation's religious multiplicity have created or exacerbated changes in American public life and politics as well. Diverse people, of course, practice divergent uh, beliefs, styles of worship, and moral codes. And often enough, these divergences cause enough friction to land in court. The question for devoutly religious persons of all kinds in our country who wish to have a material influence on American public life is how to square their convictions, their religious convictions, with the mandates of democratic governance in a heterogeneous republic. And certainly shifts have occurred in how some groups of Christians, especially, have seen their role in uh, this world, not to stand apart from public life and politics, uh, as many once did, but to uh, infuse and be active and openly active in the political process uh, so they can infuse more of what they consider Christian values into the American legal and judicial uh, systems. Much of the recent fervor around this issue has, of course, come in the wake of 9-11 and everything that has transpired uh, politically since then, and the fear that has been stoked over and over again toward Islam as an allegedly violent, spiritually bankrupt, misogynist, and fundamentally undemocratic religion. So scholars in my world of religious studies work overtime every day to educate people to the reality that there are as many interpretations of Islam all over the world um, as there are interpretations of Christianity. And that Islam as a whole over time has not been markedly more violent, misogynist, or undemocratic than Christianity or persons practicing or inspired by Christianity have been in certain historical moments. But we fear what we don't know, and the mainstream media eats that up. 
uh, and uh, for, for, for their ratings. And so we're stuck today in this clash of civilizations model that is ultimately so damaging to US diplomacy and world peace. When religion, whether we're talking about Islam, Christianity, Judaism, or, or any other, when it's wielded as a weapon against other people and, and other beliefs, frankly, no one wins. Recent US presidents, including both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, have endeavored to move us beyond that binary model. But it exerts a great deal of influence in places like talk radio and cable TV, the, the bane of the discourse of civility uh, in our nation. So clearly, religion has appeared a highly salient factor in recent elections, if, if perhaps in a more, more bewildering way in the current cycle. And despite the growing number of nuns, you know this term, nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S, right? The nuns, the people who do not profess any affiliation, despite their rise in numbers, religion's role is not diminishing. It does not in any way appear to be diminishing. Just look at any issue relating to the wars over gender and sexuality, for instance, from the ongoing debate over Planned Parenthood and the contraceptive mandate in the Affordable Care Act, to the latest actions regulating LGBT people in North Carolina, Kansas, and elsewhere. These stories cannot be told without focusing squarely on religion and the strongly held religious views about gender and sexuality that many people hold. So it's not only the fear of Islam that religion you know, manifests itself in our politics, it's not only there, it is also there in fundamental questions about women, gender, sexuality, and marriage. In short, the role of religion in US politics and public life has never seemed a more pressing concern than it is today. Now, one of our nation's most ingrained impulses, going back to early colonial settlers, is the presumption many hold that Americans may speak in the name of God. And not just that they speak in the name of God, really, but that they, we, can and do speak for God. We know uh, and we can speak for God, willing as God wills, doing as God would have us do. Invoking America as a city on the hill for all the world to emulate or to scorn if Christians somehow failed at the task, many Americans have imagined it their birthright to speak for God to all the nations. God talk, broadly defined, framed much of the political language, at least the, the language for persuading the people, for the Revolutionary War. It was used to set the justification for the Declaration of Independence. God talk fixed the terms for the idea of manifest destiny that fueled American projects of missionary and imperial conquest and that would inspire many of its foreign policy initiatives into our own time. God talk justified slavery, and it also roused the flames of abolitionism. Feminists supporting women's right to vote and anti-feminists calling on women to stay home, white supremacists fighting for a racially pure America, and civil rights workers demanding justice for African Americans, pro-life activists picketing abortion clinics, and pro-choice marchers invoking women's health and rights. Citizens on all sides of these and countless other bitter, bitter political fissures have claimed God for their cause. And often enough, the flip side of this coin has also been invoked. So that is the claim that if the other side wins, if, if my side loses and that side wins, God will punish the nation for its sins. And recall, I think one of the most famous examples of this um, was the early response of Jerry Falwell, the fundamentalist uh, leader, to 9-11. Um, and he said this a, a day or two after 9-11. Uh, he said that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who have tried to secularize America, Falwell said, I point the finger in their face and say, you helped this happen, brought about 
So the idea was, as he stated, if we decide to change all the rules on which this Judeo-Christian nation was built, we cannot expect the Lord to put his shield of protection around us as he has in the past. And that's a widely held religious point of view. Surprisingly little has changed today by some measures. We are still debating women's rights in virtually every area of our politics. Birth control itself uh, in the current moment is a divisive political issue. In my current hometown of Clayton, Missouri, the seat of St. Louis County that also includes uh, the town of Ferguson, the clergy who have stood up in support of the African-American community have been attacked as communist traitors to America and all things Christian. Political issues ranging from capital punishment to tax hikes to affirmative action, gun rights to abortion rights, Obamacare to subsidized daycare all get framed by many, certainly not by all, but they get framed in religious terms and take on religiously inflected arguments. Which leads us inexorably to the 2016 presidential race, one of the most surprising in recent history. So if you think back a year or so ago, uh, most informed observers believed that Ted Cruz or possibly Ben Carson would likely capture the religious base of the Republican Party, the values voters for short. And many presumed that if angry conservatives frustrated with the current status quo went for a maverick over an establishment candidate like Jeb Bush or John Kasich, the victor would be Cruz. Instead, as we all now know, Republican primary voters, including many of the most of these values voters that we're talking about, um, went for the least religious Republican in the field even while knowing fully from Donald Trump's serial marriages, sexual braggadocio, and multiple conflicting statements on abortion, for instance, not to mention his gaffes uh, like two Corinthians, they knew that he was not a traditional values candidate. Some political scientists are, are not surprised and weren't surprised at all. As Princeton's Nolan McCarty said, the notion that evangelical voters are non-responsive to anything other than abortion and homosexuality overstates the power of religion on political choice. Um, instead of religion, what seems instead to be motivating most Trump supporters um, is the notion that he's the candidate who tells it like it is and will bring needed change. The liberal Presbyterian, liberal in terms of his uh, older uh, religious affiliation, in terms of liberal Protestant, the Presbyterian Trump does, of course, signal his support for values voters on a range of issues, such as his frequent promise that Americans will start saying Merry Christmas again if he is elected. There was his January speech at Liberty University, Jerry Falwell's uh, university, that pledged I'm going to protect Christians. And there is his pledge to ban Muslims from coming into the US at all because of terrorism and the security risk that he believes Muslims pose. Uh, that is a message that's been shown to appeal to many values voters still wanting the US to be a Christian nation. But others, most prominently, I think, the Southern Baptist leader, Russell Moore. Uh, Russell Moore is president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, which is the public policy arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, it's very highly placed in this very conservative, uh, predominantly white denomination. So Russell Moore has rejected this stance, Trump's stance, as fundamentally anti-Christian. As Moore wrote in a New York Times op-ed, a little bit ago uh, in an op-ed that was aimed squarely at Trump, he wrote, this election has cast light on the darkness of pent-up nativism and bigotry all over the country. There are not so coded messages denouncing African Americans and immigrants. Concern about racial justice and national unity is ridiculed as political correctness. Religious minorities are scapegoated for the sins of others with basic religious freedoms for them called into question. 
Many of those who have criticized Mr. Trump's vision for America have faced threats and intimidation from the white supremacists and nativists who hide behind avatars on social media, end quote. That is a Southern Baptist speaking there. The gospel implications of this situation could not be clearer, Moore concludes. He says, the man on the throne in heaven, in his view, is a dark-skinned, Aramaic-speaking foreigner who is probably not all that impressed by chants of Make America Great Again. On a recent Face the Nation broadcast, uh, Moore called Trump's campaign reality television mor moral sewage, sparking a Twitter war, what else, with Trump, that has thus far included Trump calling Moore a nasty guy with no heart, and Moore uh, comparing Trump, and by extension, his supporters, with those people in the book of 1 Kings whom Elijah condemned for abandoning God and instead following the, the pagan prophets of Baal. So Trump supporters as you know, worshipers of, of Baal, the idol, uh, rather than God. But other religious leaders have a wholly different view of Trump, seeing him as the candidate who will best serve Christians and the nation. Shortly before officially endorsing Trump, Jerry Falwell Jr., who is now president of Liberty University, his father's university, said that Trump lives a life of loving and helping others as Jesus taught in the Great Commandment. Robert Jeffress, pastor of the 12,000 member First Baptist Church in Dallas, responded to the Republicans, the Republicans who vowed not to vote for Trump. To them, Jeffress said, I think the Bible has a word for people like that, fools. And he later added, if Donald Trump is elected president of the United States, we who are evangelical Christians are going to have a true friend in the White House. And then, just a couple of weeks ago, Trump met with a group of leading evangelical leaders, and soon James Dobson, uh, a very prominent Christian leader, as I'm sure you know, James Dobson announced that Trump was a born-again Christian, an announcement that prompted roars of bitter, hysterical laughter across the country, uh, as Andy Borowitz titled his satirical piece in The New Yorker, Trump's bid to become born again fails as Jesus turns down friend requ request. <laughs> so for my part, when I heard Dobson speculate that it was Paula White, the prosperity gospel televangelist whom one could well describe as a bombshell, if that word is still used, that it was Paula White who brought Trump to Christ, I thought, of course, it had to be a hot-looking woman, one that he considers hot-looking. And indeed, just this morning, uh, fortunately just in time for today's talk, in an online piece titled Donald Trump's God Whisperer, uh, the online site Politico reported on Paula White's relationship with Trump, and it's a fascinating article which I recommend to you. If you go to politico.com, uh, you'll see it, uh, that it was just posted this morning. Um, so their relationship between Paula, Trump, uh, pa Paula White and Donald Trump apparently spans more than 14 years. I can absolutely tell you, White told the Politico reporter, that Mr. Trump has a relationship with God. He is a Christian. He accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. The reporter goes on to say, and I'm going to quote at some length here because it's a, it's a really strong piece. Uh, the reporter says, the two, f the two people first connected when Trump, who was watching Christian television, saw her on screen and called her saying she was fantastic. On her next trip to New York, the Florida-based White met with him, marking the start of a close cross-country friendship. Over the years, that relationship grew stronger and stronger, she said, of her ties to Trump. I was in New York for many years. He has a very open-door policy. If I was in town, he'd say, hey, Paula, come by, hang out with friends, family. He'd allow me to sit in his office, be a part of his life, his world, end quote. Now, White herself is very controversial, you may or may not know. Uh, many other prominent evangelical leaders distance themselves from her, um, in part because of the whiff of scandal that has surrounded uh, some of her financial dealings and her three marriages and her emphasis on wealth 
as, uh, as well as the scrutiny of her ministry's uh, spending practices. She got scrutiny from the IRS and even a congressional probe that was led by Republican Senator Chuck Grassley. So she's controversial. Um, and Trump's evangelical nemesis, Russell Moore, just quoted, recently tweeted, Paula White is a charlatan and recognized as a heretic by every Orthodox Christian of whatever tribe, end quote. In the end, though, whether Trump himself is a conservative Christian or not does not matter to most of these, most of these religious voters. Their support is about what they believe he will do for the country, not his religion. And it's a fascinating debate uh, that you could perhaps characterize as principle versus pragmatism, and we can expect this to continue right up to the election, of course. But it may be more than just mere pragmatism. Uh, another prominent Baptist leader whom I just mentioned, Robert Jeffress, who is a member of Trump's Evangelical Advisory Committee, was quoted in today's New York Times, thank you so much again for another uh, timely piece, for having what the op-ed writer called a more utilitarian motive for backing Trump. This writer, Robbie Jones, says, Rather than trying to defend Mr. Trump's Christian credentials, Mr. Jeffress bluntly said that in the face of perceived threats facing evangelicals, he said, I want the meanest, toughest son of a you-know-what I can find in that role, and I think that's where many evangelicals are, end quote. Uh, so here, and also in his forthcoming book, The End of White Christian America, Robert Jones analyzes the anger, anxiety, and insecurity of many white evangelicals in an election where, for the first time, white Christians are no longer a majority in the country. They've slipped from 54% the year that Barack Obama was first elected in 2008 to 45% today and where the Supreme Court determined that gay and lesbian couples have an equal right to marriage in all 50 states. So, so evangelicals, in other words, white evangelical Christians feel threatened. And according to Jones's research, nearly two thirds of white evangelical Protestants are perturbed by encounters with immigrants who uh, speak little English, and more than, more than two thirds, think that discrimination against evangelicals and against white people in particular has become a huge problem. So describing why evangelicals went for Trump instead of their fellow evangelical crews, Jones writes, Ted Cruz assured evangelicals that he'd secure them exemptions from the new realities, while Mr. Trump promised to reinstate their central place in the country. Mr. Cruz offered to negotiate a respectable retreat strategy, while Mr. Trump vowed to turn back the clock. For white evangelical Protestants, Mr. Trump's general vow to make America great again means something specific, the restoration of white Christian dominance. And if this interests you, by the way, I highly recommend uh, this forthcoming book. It's by Robert P. Jones. It's called The End of White Christian America. One of the trade presses is publishing it. It's getting a lot of attention right now. And uh, I've, I've read it in galleys, and it's, it's excellent. OK, there's Trump. So this leaves Hillary Clinton as by far the most religious candidate left in the 2016 presidential race. Now, for a long time, many have written about Clinton's uh, well-documented Methodist upbringing and the social gospel Christianity that is fundamental to her own values. Her youth pastor in suburban Chicago, where she grew up, Don Jones, made a practice of taking Clinton and other youth to the south side of Chicago to work on soup lines and to face head-on issues of racism and poverty, crime and teenage pregnancy, drugs and homelessness, and, and, and so forth. And in 1962, Clinton was among that group, the group of, of youth, who were driven to hear Martin Luther King Jr. speak in Chicago's Orchestra Hall. Since she served as First Lady, she has spoken about the need for what she calls a new politics of meaning, saying things like, we have to summon up 
what we believe is morally and ethically and spiritually correct and do the best we can with God's guidance, end quote. Just this past weekend, Clinton spoke at the AME General Convention on the 200th anniversary of the founding of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. This was in Philadelphia. Expressing solidarity with the audience through their shared Christian faith, and she began her talk talking a lot about her faith, she led the assembly in prayer for the families and loved ones grieving after last week's highly publicized tragic deaths. Two at the hands of police officers, Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, and the five police officers subsequently killed by a sniper while they were protecting peaceful demonstrators. We know there is something wrong with our country, Clinton stated. There is too much violence, too much hate, too much senseless killing, too many people dead who shouldn't be. Scripture tells us to incline our ears to wisdom and apply our hearts to understanding. That's an end quote. She spoke both in this talk, it's about a half hour, and it's easy, you can find this online too if you're interested, but she spoke both in favor of criminal justice reform, that is, that there be fewer unnecessary killings, particularly of African Americans, by police officers, and she spoke just as strongly in support for police departments and the officers who risk their own lives every day to protect all citizens. She also spoke strongly in favor of gun reform, and she closed by quoting from the New Testament book of Galatians. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now, many of her opponents see Clinton less as fundamentally Christian than fundamentally dishonest. But still, her commitment to Methodist principles of social justice has been evident across decades, and her varied roles as a lawyer, as first lady, New York senator, and secretary of state. As she told the United Methodist Women's Assembly last year, reported by uh, the Religion News Service, her Christian faith has inspired her to be an advocate for children and families, for women and men around the world who are oppressed and persecuted, denied their human rights and human dignity. But Clinton, as a supporter of Planned Parenthood and a supporter of reproductive rights, gay rights, same-sex marriage, equal pay for women, and, and on and on, these views lead many conservative uh, religious voters to disbelieve her faith claims and to condemn her as effectively unchristian, if not anti-Christian. That's why I'm writing this book, the Moral Combat book that you mentioned earlier, because I think these are the issues that roil us over and over again, and that's exactly what many people seize upon uh, when they um, uh, oppose uh, Hillary Clinton. Godvoter.com, a conservative rating site for Christian voters gives Clinton a D minus rating as a Christian candidate, arguing that she should be arrested and prosecuted for numerous crimes. And as one conservative youth pastor who was explaining why Christians should not support Clinton's candidacy because of her views on abortion and gay marriage, um, as this person blogged, God holds us accountable for what we do behind the voting booth curtain. End quote. Where this leads us today, where this leaves us today is wholly unclear, I suppose, but judging from our history, there is no doubt that religion will continue to be a significant, very complicated, and multifaceted factor in our politics for the foreseeable future. What we cannot foresee, of course, is just how it will appear and what its most successful uses will be, its most successful political uses. Will religion most effectively be used as a weapon against political opponents, a weapon to bludge the opposition, bludgeon them into submission, a tool for interfaith dialogue, cooperation, and collaboration, 
Will religion be inspiration for both conservative and progressive activism? Will it be motivation to vote for both Trump and for Clinton and future candidates on and on? And what role, finally, will religion play across the globe where I began? Will it continue to provoke or aggravate violence? Surely, yes, it always has. Will religion inspire activism for social justice, care for the poor, lives of sacrifice and service? Absolutely, it always has. Which forces seem ultimately more powerful is partly a matter of perspective and timing and space and where we look at any given moment in any particular time. Where religion turns up next then, we will just have to wait and see. Thank you. Sure, yes. Just the glare is slightly in my face, so just raise your hand high if you do. Yes. So, uh, you mentioned Dan Harris and Richard Dawkins. Mm -hmm. I wonder, from your vantage point, which is much better than most of us have, if we were to project religion to a sort of a binary candidate, would it look as good? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get beyond, in a way. Uh, but I, I hear your point, and but I think it's where you look. If you, it, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Yes, of course. Uh, so the question was that I mentioned Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, and the question is, if you try to step back and really take a global view, that right, um, is religion has it done more good or bad? And I think, I don't know how to answer that question, to be honest with you, so let me do my best. Um, I think if you look at global politics and you look at the way that religion can inspire horrific acts of violence, if that's where you're looking politically in that way, I think it's done more bad than good. Um, Christians were terribly violent in the Crusades. Uh, all, all the religions you know, have had their violence. We can't pick on any single one because they've all uh, been uh, perpetrators of horrific violence at different moments and different places in time. I think what I want to also highlight is looking at other ways of thinking about religion, which is this inspiration to a life of service and sacrifice and on-the-ground work, no matter what is going on in that, in that global political world. Um, so that's what I mean when I say I think it's a matter of perspective if you see religion as doing more good than harm. Um, because if you look at, you know, who is fighting the good fight to feed the hungry, for instance, you know, you're, you're going to find mostly religious people, you know, maybe less and less as people become more comfortable with calling themselves secular, atheist, agnostic. But at least up to now, that's been true. So, um, I don't know, is that a good enough answer? I, I, I know, I, I just try to bring some new to the to my answer because I think you could see it both ways. Yes. To what extent do you see our current um, situation blessing and religion as something new? And to what extent do you see it echoing things that have occurred in the past, maybe even the distant past, like the Reformation? Are there echoes of the past that you see are being play, played out now? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, so I'm trained as a historian, and, you know, historians drive journalists crazy because they always call us and they say, you know, what's this new thing? I see there's a trend, and we all say, no, it's all happened before. <laughs> so, so in some ways, I would say I always see precedents in the past, for sure, as you're suggesting. And, you know, I haven't done my Reformation history in a while, so I'd, I'd be on shaky ground to be very specific going back, you know, before the U.S., which is my specialty. But certainly, I see the motivations and the types of conflicts that we see, um, and much else besides, I, I think they all have long historical precedents. What is new is the way that those things get disseminated through technology and how, how information gets shared and how things spread and the sort of rapid pace that all of this goes. That has a huge impact on religion. And the other thing that is new is just the, you know, this internationalization, 
you know, really, as I said, the U.S. is sort of a mirror of all the world's religions, but people of all religions are going elsewhere, too. You know, more and more, many parts of the globe are becoming very religiously and ethnically diverse, and that's part of the motivation for all the, you know, awful conflict that we see. So I certainly see continuity with the issues and the kinds of passion uh, that people have, the love of power, that's certainly uh, inherently human, isn't it? It's not new. But the way those conflicts get played out, I, I would see as, as fairly recent. Yes? Mm-hmm. Uh, one size and fits all universally. It's a set of rules, the Ten Commandments. Uh, I believe our U.S. Constitution was designed with that in mind. It's just simply what determines a human discipline, where no harm is, it represents a utopian resistance where nothing ever goes wrong. I think uh, one of the rules of those is uh, love thy neighbor. Mm -hmm. Hmm. We become a submissive society. We must keep these ten commandments in our schools. Well, the Roman Republican Party at our state convention, the platform committee wanted to remove uh, the line uh, marriage is between one man and one woman. And it was resoundingly uh, kept in. Everyone wants to see a change, a more positive. Okay. Well, thank you for your perspective. That's yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I don't I disagree uh, with some of what you say, and I agree with some of what you say. Um, I guess the one piece I would touch on that I think, so, you know, I work with Senator Danforth a lot, and probably many of you remember Senator Danforth from his years in the Senate, um, you know, Senator, Republican Senator from Missouri. Um, and he recently published a book that's called The Relevance of Religion. Um, and I'm blanking on the subtitle, but it's sort of, you know, how religious values can bring us back together. And, and, and he shares some of the perspective that you're describing, so you might find that an interesting book. Um, he wants to look at religion as being something that, yes, is about love your neighbor and compassion for others. It's about finding ways of compromise. He, he sets out all of these different kinds of values. And I think there are many you know, religious people out there. He's an Episcopal priest, by the way, as well as the former senator, I should say, um, you know, who share that. So thank you. Yeah. Is there a role for the black church in solving some of these racial issues beyond the Terry Caldwell? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what I, uh, yes, uh, there is, but I think there's a role for, for all the churches and all religious organizations, and I don't think it should all be put on the black church. But that said, um, you know, living, I, I literally live 10 minutes from Ferguson, and so, you know, St. Louis, of course, has been roiled uh, in, in recent uh, years, the last couple of years, by, uh, you know, what happened to Michael Brown and everything that happened since then. And it's the clergy who have been the most actively involved in uh, the local Black Lives Matter uh, you know, movement, but also in kind of trying to bring people together across multiple kinds of divides about meeting with police officers, meeting with law enforcement, trying to understand all the different points of view. And that's, that's clergy from the African-American churches and the predominantly white churches. It's rabbis. Uh, there's uh, some wonderful uh, rabbis, Susan Talby, who uh, actually won a, an award for, from uh, President Obama for her work uh, on those issues. 
So I absolutely believe there's a role uh, for the black church in solving these issues for sure, but they can't do it without the collaboration and cooperation of a lot of other people. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, just couldn't see your hand, yes. You know, I was so afraid someone would ask me that and I forgot to look it up today. Well, the, the numbers get better and better, <laughs> I think, uh, because, you know, um, polling information, uh, the, the aggregate kinds of ways that people do research, it does get better and better. So I, I would say the numbers are so much better even today than they were, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I, I should have looked this up before I came and I really don't know. I mean, you know, Jews sort of remain at, a, at a, a very small percentage of the population, as we know, and yet, you know, they're, they're very influential in many areas of government and, and elsewhere. Um, the Catholic numbers have risen in recent years, but that's largely due to Hispanic uh, and Latino and Mexican and South American migration. So it's a very different looking Catholicism. Uh, than it once was. Uh, you know, the Catholic Church, talking about the Catholic Church in politics is its own amazing sort of subject because, of course, there are, it's so deeply divided. The people on the ground are so deeply divided on many issues. Um, so when I say that white Christians are no longer a majority, that really is referring to the people who are really active in asserting themselves as Christians. And what we know is a lot of people do self-identify as Christian and, and really don't, don't know where to go to church anymore, don't find themselves in uh, an evangelical setting. You know, the, the liberal Protestant church that they went to is tiny now, it's got 15 members left. So there's a lot of folks who still identify with Christian values as they see them, and people interpret those different ways. Um, then there are, uh, you know, uh, people who self-identify to pollsters. So I'm sorry I can't be more specific. There's uh, the Public Religion Research Institute is a great place to go for the latest statistics and studies on, um, on those statistics. Yes. You know, yeah, that is such an interesting. Oh, I'm so sorry, I keep forgetting to do that. So the, the question is, um, what today is the religious in, the, the influence of religious leaders upon their flocks, I guess, right? I mean, do people do what their ministers are calling on them to do? Are ministers really overt in who they uh, talk about as candidates? My view on this, I, so for my dissertation, I did a lot of on the ground field work which, with a very conservative evangelical uh, network, excuse me, a parachurch organization. And I can tell you, they were overt about politics. You know, that was during the Bill Clinton years. And, you know, it, it could not have been more, more overt even at election times. So I think that um, religious leaders find ways to get around the tax exemption threat, um, you know, by, <laughs> in what they write and publish and maybe what they say specifically in the pulpit where they're heard publicly. But behind the scenes, I think they've been, you know, recommending particular candidates for a long time or focusing on a certain issue that makes it obvious, you know, who, who the, the proper candidate should be. Yes. We ain't what? What? We ain't paying to oh. Mecca. No. Oh, to Mecca. Got it. Okay. And what I'm really curious about is it seems like in the last hundred years, Jews, of which I am like Thomas Shelby, Jewish person, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been like embraced by kind of those Christian dominant societies, even, you know, Judeo Christian is now a term. Yep. I'm really curious in the Jewish history and we have a field trip every year to the mosque. Mm. Great. How So comparing how um, Muslims 
may more fully, I don't like this word for this, but integrate into American society or become sort of Americanized and accepted by um, other non-Muslim Americans compared to the Jewish uh, history and example. Is, right, that got that. So uh, th let me just say, so the Jewish history is very interesting because of course Jews have been in America, you know, f long before, you know, even the waves of 19th century immigration. Um, they have also been profoundly discriminated against as we know in various moments in time, but there's a familiarity that I think um, Americans have with Jews that just comes in part from years and years and years of just being accustomed to, and over time having Jewish neighbors, having you know, Jewish uh, friends in the schools, and, and just that kind of, of, of constant sort of interaction. Um, then the issue of Israel is also one, of course, that unites um, many uh, evangelical Christians or many other Christians. Fo let me just say, folks who agree on Israeli issues tend to also unite, whether they're Christian, Jewish, and that's become a real, uh, you know, kind of meeting point. Islam, you know, we really have not, there were a few, of course, what we once had in um, the U.S. in terms of Islam was the nation of Islam. We had, you know, the kind of black power version of Islam that, that put so many white Americans completely off of, um, you know, everything having to do with that, including Islam. So there was that stereotype. And then, of course, we have only had uh, immigrant Muslims really coming in, you know, since the mid 60s and, and thereafter. So I think part of the, part of what I would say is there is not the familiarity. Um, and because of all of these events of 9 11 and, and the kinds of, you know, what, what appear to be over and over and over again, um, you know, Muslim suicide bombers, ISIL, all the, you know, Al Qaeda, all the things that have arisen you know, there is a great deal of fear. And, you know, sometimes I want to say, you know, it's understandable fear. Instead of criticizing people who are afraid, like, let's, let's try to figure out, you know, who our neighbors are and who the Muslims here are and what's causing all this. I think there's a great deal of um, ignorance that we all have about Islam. I have a PhD in religion from Harvard, and I never took a course in Islam. How is that possible? So, you know, it, it, it was just the religion that you didn't talk about for a long time or no one needed to know very much about and, uh, and regions of the world people haven't traveled to in the same way. So I would say, you know, my guess and my hope would be over time with some of the growing familiarity, at least domestically, you know, you would, you would see more of what you see in the Jewish example. The question is what's gonna happen internationally? Um, and, you know, with the kind of the, um, is, you know, Islamic inspired or Islamic utilized or Islamic exploited violence um, that so many people now associate with Islam. Yes. Oh my goodness, wow. Thank you for your unimportant tiny question. Um, so did everyone hear that so sort of, you know, really trying to have some perspective? How would we see, you know, recent acts of terroristic violence in some kind of broader, longer historical perspective? I w truly, I have to be honest, I'd have to think, I, I think that's a really important question and I would really have to think about that a lot. I mean, on the one hand, Yes, what people in my field always want to say is there has always been religious violence, but there have not always been the technological mechanisms of suicide bombing um, and, and, and the kind of increasing proliferation through technology in the internet in such large part and YouTube and, and all these places people can get this to sort of spread that stuff quickly, to spread that hatred and techniques of violence and destruction. So, you know, what I, if I'm being honest, uh, without thinking about it too much, yeah, it seems totally unprecedented what, what we have today um, because of the technologies that are now available to us. 
um, you know, the massacres we've seen in the U.S. that are not, you know, uh, not ISIL. Um, they're these kind of single, uh, I don't know what they call lone wolf shooters or whatever, you know, those are possible because of technology and the, and the technology of assault uh, rifles and, and all the rest of it. So there, I don't ever want to say there's nothing new. Um, I, I certainly see that as new. But the hatred of others is deep. <laughs> I mean, the hatred of people who look different, who behave differently, you know, who eat different foods, and you see that all across the globe. That, that appears to be a sort of you know, human uh, response in many ways that we, that we have to sort of overcome or we raise our children uh, to not think that way if we, if we don't want them, if we want them to be pluralistic. So that's long-winded, but uh, I, I certainly see a lot of the, again, the kind of motivations and the fears and all that seem to me um, human and uh, if not universal in some way. But um, yes, technologically, it's all new territory. As we slip off the scale of human and uh, degrade ourselves, I believe that's what um, brings about that animosity from the Islamic nations. Uh, if we started teaching the Ten Commandments in school and things like that and preparing our human discipline, I think all that would become dormant again. Thank you. Yes, no, I no, and you said that before. Right. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes, so how do we get back to the mandate of separation of church and state when there is so much religious influence in politics? Uh, that, is, that is the great uh, puzzle that people in my field, we really think about that and talk about that a lot because church-state separation is not the same thing as religion and politics separation, and that's part of what you're saying. Um, people are always motivated by their values. They're motivated by the way they interpret their scriptures and their traditions. Um, it's all interpretation in some way, uh, you know, uh, ultimately. And so you've got all of that. Of course, religion affects politics. Any religious person, the, their views are going to affect the way they vote. And, uh, you know, you can't really condemn that because it's just, that's just, you know, uh, natural in some way. The question is, when does that come into these constitutional questions of church and state? One of the very interesting things um, to, to say about that is, and there are scholars of constitutional law and religion who have written about this, if you look back over Supreme Court decisions over time pertaining to religion, they are all over the place, really. And, and part of the reason for that is they, we don't have a clear definition of what a religion is and, and what, what a, even what a church is. They have to sort of invent it over and over again you know, our Indian smoking peyote, where is that religion? And this group over here, okay, where are we going to protect the Scientologist? Is that religion? So there's, I think that's part of why constitutionally we kind of go over the same ground over and over again. For people who believe in the contraceptive mandate in Obamacare and think that should be the law, you know, those who disagree with that are trampling on their religious freedoms. I mean, there are religious arguments on that side to say, you know, do not, um, you know, trample on that. But the folks on the other side see it as a religious freedom issue. And both of those are, and that's a constitutional, <laughs> constitutionally protected thing too. So it's usually where those two things come to, you know, where they collide. Church-state separation and religious freedom you know, that's, you know, right there is where so many of the conflicts lie. And, and it'll just depend on how, what the Supreme Court continues to look like, where we go with all of that, I think. So, Ms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.